My name's Dave Goulson, uh, and I'm going to take you on a little tour of my garden um, to show you a few of the best flowers for bumblebees um, and other bees and butterflies and so on. Um, I've only had this garden a couple of years, so it hasn't got everything I'd like yet I'm working on it, um, but it's still got quite a few nice things and lots of happy bees, so uh, come with me on a tour of the garden. So first up we've got uh, this rather beautiful blue comfrey. It flowers a bit earlier than the comfreys people usually grow in their gardens. Um, this is, uh, I think, Symphytum called Caseycum. Um, in fact, there's a bee just over there, a little uh, worker, Bombus terrestris in the background. Um, really nice, uh, low-growing, spreading plant. Very, very easy to grow perennial and uh, it flowers from mid-April right through May. Um, really good for the bees. There's a great big queen, Bombus Pascor, on there at the back. Um, and here we have the chives. Very useful garden herb, great in omelettes and all sorts. And just coming into flower uh, in uh, early May now. Um, really popular with short-tongued bumblebees. You get things like Bombus pretorum, the early bumblebee, all over this. No one here yet, because you can see these flowers are just beginning to open. Um, but really easy to grow perennial. Just kind of spread a bit. Um, actually, it's coming out of the cracks in my patio and starting to take over. Um, but who cares? The bees like it. This one's perennial wallflower, um, Erysimum bowls mauve. It's actually a, a sterile form of a wild plant that grows in Tenerife. And because it's sterile it never sets any seeds and because it never sets any seeds it just carries on flowering right through the year from um, end of April to October, um, even longer if there's no heavy frost. Um, popular with a whole range of bees for nectar. Um, it's actually a member of the, uh, the cabbage family, the Cruciferae, should you be interested. Here we have some geraniums. These are uh, yet another easy to grow perennial. Flowers in mid to late spring. There's a little Osmia just went past. In fact, if you bear with me, we're going to whiz over here. And there we've got a, I think this is a, yeah, a garden bumblebee, Bombus hortorum, a queen. Very long tongue there. Um, feeding on the geraniums. There's actually loads of bees buzzing around, even though these flowers. Uh, only came into flower a few days ago, but they're already sucking in the bees. Um, so these, there's, there's lots of different garden varieties of geranium. Most of the ones I've ever tried growing seem to be good for bumblebees. Lots of different colours, there's blues and pinks and so on. Um, uh, really nice little plants. Every garden should have a few of these somewhere. They just look after themselves, they don't mind a bit of shade. Um, really easy. Uh, if you hack them down when they finish flowering, if you're lucky they'll spring back into flower a few weeks later as well and you get a longer flowering season. This little thing is bush vetch. This is a, uh, a member of the pea family. Um, so it's a nitrogen fixing uh, Fabaceae, but there are lots of species of uh, Fabaceae and bumblebees tend to like most of them. This is just coming into flower. Uh, it's bush vetch. Um, and it flowers right through the summer um, and Bombus pascorum common carters absolutely love it um, but these are the first two or three flowers on this plant so can't actually see any bees this morning but I'm sure they'll be along soon enough as it carries on flowering. This pretty flower's uh, bugle um, is the common name and there are garden varieties that this is actually the wild variety that grows in Britain. Um, it's a kind of uh, woodland edge plant, um, doesn't mind a bit of shade at all. Just flowers for two or three weeks in, uh, in, in May, um, but great for long-tongued bumblebees like Bombus hortor on the garden bumblebee. Um, and uh, just a lovely little low-growing plant to have creeping around in your flower beds. Now this is another comfrey. This is, I think, um, Symphytum ibericum. Lovely kind of two-tone flowers. They start out pink and turn a kind of cream and mauve at the end. Um, 
Again, great one for bees. This has been flowering now for about a month. Um, we're in mid-May, um, 10th of May, in fact. Um, uh, and it's had bees all over it uh, all the time it's been flowering. That said, right now, not a bee to be seen, but they'll, oh, what was that? They'll be back, that's for sure. Um, kind of clump forming, it's only about two feet tall. Uh, really easy, tough plant to grow, it grows more or less anywhere. And uh, just looks after itself and sucks in the bees every year. Now, here we've got a rather scraggy Ceanothus. I planted this last year. It's coming along, it's just started flowering this year for the first time. Um, there are lots of different types of Ceanothus. Some form quite tall shrubs, um, six, seven, eight feet tall. Some of them quite low growing, just a foot or two off the ground. All of them pretty popular with bees when they get going. This one hasn't got enough flowers on it yet to do much. Next year, I'm hoping, it'll be amazing. Uh, but Ceanothus, it's a Californian shrub. Uh, really good for bees. Um, let's, uh, let's hope it thrives in my garden. I can't resist showing you this one. Um, it's not actually that fantastic for bees, but you do get them on it, particularly long-tongued bees like the garden bumblebee. Um, it's red campion, uh, Selene dioica, a native wildflower. Um, I've grown it in my garden for many, many years. Um, it's just a really pretty native wildflower. It's a perennial, it self-seeds a bit, so you need to keep a bit of an eye on it, but it's easy enough to hoe out the seedlings if you don't want it to spread. Interesting that it's an unusual plant in that the, the, the flowers are either male or, the plants are either male or female, so um, this one we're looking at is a male plant, it only produces pollen, doesn't set any seeds. Um, and just over here um, we've got um, a female plant, so she'll hopefully get pollinated and, and be the ones that they form big pods with lots of seeds inside that shake out in late summer. So it's a dioecious plant and just generally very lovely wildflower to grow in the garden. Here we've got uh, flowering currant. So this is a close relative of the black currants and red currants we grow to eat. Um, it's actually just going over at this time of year. It's great for the bees through April and into the beginning of May. This is what one is now on its last legs. Most of the flowers have dropped off. Um, but every garden should have one if there's room. It's a nice little compact kind of shrub, grows. This one's actually the biggest I've seen, which is it's probably about eight or nine feet tall. Um, but uh, easy, easy as anything to grow, and uh, really good at source of early spring forage for a whole range of bumblebees and solitary bees. This one isn't everyone's cup of tea. This is a rhododendron. Um, there are lots of species of rhododendron you can grow. Of course, one in rhododendron ponticum is a real pain as an invasive weed in this country, um, and you'd be well advised not to grow that. But in, in a garden setting, um, the other species are actually really pretty plants, different, loads of different colours, reds, whites, blues, purples, and so on. Um, and pretty much all the ones I've ever seen. Bees love them. A um, the whole range of bee species come um, for the pollen and the nectar. There's an interesting kind of story. The nectar of some rhododendrons actually has low concentrations of a toxin called groyanotoxin. Um, and if, if bees feed exclusively on it, and this is honeybees, and make honey from it, and then people eat lots of that honey, um, it actually makes them mad. It's called mad honey. Um, unfortunately, there's not many places where rhododendrons are common enough in the wild for that to happen, um, mainly around the Black Sea. Um, so I wouldn't worry about that in the garden, and you've got honeybees. Um, but again, good, good shrub to have if you've got room. And as long as you don't get rhododendron ponticum, um, good one for the bees. Now look at this, my favourite at this time of year. My apple trees are all in full bloom. Got some enormous, two big old bramleys there, um, covered in blossom. And uh, the pear trees as well, um, all in flower. I've, I've planted about 50 apple trees in the garden. There's a honeybee busy pollinating my apples. Um, there's all sorts of insects buzzing around now, the sun's warming up. Um, lots of bumblebees, solitary bees, flies, hoverflies, all sorts of things on, on the apples. Of course, being trees, you just get loads of flowers on them, far more than you're going to get from a herbaceous plant because of the height they have. Um, generally, top tip, if you've got room, 
flowering trees are, I think, a more effective way of feeding lots of bees than herbaceous borders. Anyway, um, if you've got room, everyone should have apples and maybe pears as well. Um, lovely for the bees and, of course, um, lovely for the fruit. These I mostly use for cider and it's damn fine. Okay, that's it from me for this month. I shall be back uh, in June with yet more garden flowers and bees. See you then.